So can you tell me about the background to this report, land use change on the margins of low land in Canterbury? Why, why have we done this? Okay. Um, the, Canterbury, uh, the Canterbury Water Management Strategy it was developed by, really under the sponsorship of the Canterbury Mural Forum. <clears throat> and that happened during the sort of the latter part of the, two, of the 2000s. Um, the Canterbury Water Management Strategy was finalised in 2009 and, one of, and it, it sets up a number of targets um, for um, the community supported by the councils to work on going forward. One of those targets was the protection of braided rivers. I mean, it was recognised that braided rivers are, are quite rare um, and Canterbury has more than its fair share of them and, and protecting them and protecting the quite distinctive biodiversity that lives on them was really important. Um, so the report that you referred to was a result of, 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 of that focus on, on braided rivers under the Canterbury Water Management Strategy. Our staff, our, our ecologists that did that report, I guess, to inform um, the various zone committees and the regional committee that is part of the Canterbury Water Management Strategy about what needs to be done looking into the future. Um, the fact that it's been brought to the public's attention now doesn't mean that it wasn't being worked on, it's been used by um, our, our regional committee and by a number of zone committees um, to help them put their work programs together. Mm. And so in this report essentially we're talking about 12,000 hectares <coughs> of um, riverbed encroachment, 40% of which is owned by the Crown, Lynn's, Dock, regional councils. So with this encroachment, is it a historical thing and how has this been allowed to happen? Okay. Um, it's, it's very difficult not to use sort of emotive words in this and I think it's important to, to talk about it in the context that we operated in 20 or 30 years ago. Um, the regional council's predecessors were a, a wide range of, of organisations that had sort of individual responsibilities for things like flood control, erosion control, pest control, there were rabbit boards, there were all, all those sorts of things. And so consequently, some of these leases were, I think some of the leases that are currently in place um, were probably granted during, during that era by, and then the regional council sort of inherited them. And if you think about what people thought was important back in those days, um, you know, the control of floods, uh, protecting communities and farmland from floods, um, getting rid of um, uh, pests like Marcella and uh, rabbits, they were, they, were, they were at the forefront of everybody's minds. So a lot of these leases were part of that context. Um, Environment Canterbury or its predecessors owned land that, was re that, that they were required to own for, um, for flood protection reasons, for example. Um, after the flood protection was put in place, there was still the business of how do you maintain that land. So if there were a few hectares of land alongside a river that, that we owned because of our, our responsibilities, we then had the task of how do we look after it? How do we keep it pest free? How do we keep it weed free? Um, and the simple answer was that it was, it, was, it was very convenient to go to the local landowner and say, would you like to lease this piece of land? So I think a lot of the a lot of the situations we're in at the moment are for those sorts of reasons. There will be other examples as well, but it's really important to, to sort of appreciate that back in 1990, and even later than that, um, even though the scientists and the ecologists might have thought braided rivers were really important, the wider community probably didn't have any perspective like that. So those understandings have developed significantly over the last 20 years. And you know, I think that's the sort of reason why we're in the situation we're in now. It's almost as though no one's really at fault either. It's just that sometimes, sometimes we're a bit slow in catching up with trends that we should catch up with. We've caught up with them now, but we do have this legacy um, that clearly is less than less than what we'd like to have. Um, but provided I think we manage those leases and the land where consents have been granted really well, I think we can. Um, I guess mitigate some of the damage for the future anyway. Mm. And I guess with the ECAN owned land, only some of that is needed for a flood protection, right? The rest of it that the farmers have, you know, it makes sense to develop. They yes. also allow them to protect yeah. that. Um, 
I think in the case of the ECAN owned land, um, the, the amount of, it's very hard to answer some of these questions without looking at the specifics and, and I know that many, many people would like us to, to I guess, pro, uh, 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 have to provide more specifics and we'll do that in the future, we're, we're looking at some of these things now. But, but quite often, um, and I'll, I'll refer I think once again to what we see in the Waimakariri area, where, where a large amount of land was, was, put in, was put in reserve to be used for the protection of, 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 of the community from the Waimak. I think most people know that the Waimakariri River used to once sort of flow out um, where Lake Ellsman, uh, where Lake Ellsman uh, I mean, currently is. Um, and so there was a large piece of land that was put aside for that, put in, in reserve. It also, of course, has the benefit, um, the, the other benefit, that um, that ecan owned land is, is in an area which also supplies the drinking water for Christchurch. So there are conditions about how farmers can use that land when we do lease it to them. Um, the leasing of land is, is really simply a, a way of, 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 in the most cost effective way the council can, taking care of it. Um, there's nothing more than that beyond it. it. It just makes sense for us to do that and it also makes sense for us to try to get back a little bit of revenue that helps to keep the other rates still under control. Mm, and the money from that, because we are leasing, uh, is leasing the land to these farmers, where is the money that the farmers are paying? Where is that okay. going in the hands? In the case of the Waimakariri, which is an easier example to use, um, the, the, the money that we get from leasing the land for both farming and commercial purposes goes into paying for the flood protection. It can't be used anywhere else. It's, it's effectively like a targeted, um, um, it's a bit like a targeted rate. If we collect a rate of the community, we can only spend it for the purposes we've collected for. In this case, where we're getting rent from leases, we can only use it for the purposes that we hold those, that we actually have that land entrusted to us, which is a flood protection. And so you're talking about historically, um, you know, biodiversity and that wasn't a high priority and now, now we've sort of caught up with that. Um, what are you, is there an issue here? And if so, what is that issue and what is ECAN doing about it? Well, I, I, I guess the issue is that uh, we now know that in some cases, some of the land use that's been permitted um, on the fringes and in some cases on the great rivers um, is not appropriate going forward. And it probably wasn't appropriate in the past, but it's easy to say that because we now have more knowledge. Um, what can we do about that? Um, I think we can ensure that um, where a legitimate consent, or a resource consent has been granted to a farmer for farming activities, they stick strictly to the terms of that consent conditions of that consent. Maybe down the track somewhere, in some cases, we'll be able to um, look at whether that's an appropriate use going forward when that consent comes up for renewal. Um, but but I, I don't think we should hold our, you know, we should hold on to that too strongly because, you know, once a farmer's got a consent, they make a big investment in that land. And so just throwing them off it is not an easy option. There may be some cases where it's easier than others. Um, would you then change the conditions of that consent so they could still farm, but there's, a, there's additional conditions when, mean, a, when a consent's come up? I, I mean, when a consent expires, effectively the application is a new consent. Mm -hmm. It's not the renewal of yeah, the old consent. Yeah. So consequently, at that time, we we're able to, to, I guess, to look completely anew in it. But, but past investments have to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'd, I'd hate anybody to go away thinking that I'm saying that once a consent expires, or, or, or comes to its end, everything will go back to where it was before. I don't think that's realistic in every case. Mm. But then you could make, would you then, with the new consent, make conditions that would then protect the riverbed or stop the encroachment of the riverbed? I mean, I think if we looked at an old consent, when, when, it's, when it's being renewed and it was deficient in some areas, we could certainly put in new conditions mm. that, um, that, 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 that fulfil the sort of outcomes you're talking about. Until that happens, we can't, ECAN can't really do anything. Well, all we can do is make sure that 
the land uh, the, the land user is complying with the terms of their consent. Yeah. And in terms of these uh, high country sensitive areas, um, and in terms of working with Lids and DOC, what do you see coming out of this? Okay. Well, I do know that um, as recently as I think last week, um, the, the executive team here at, at, um, at ECAN met with um, some of the LINS senior managers, which is quite fortuitous because this is a recent conversation they've had. I think over the last 12 months or even perhaps even longer, we've been working to try to create that level of contact and start talking about some of these very issues that have now become very public. What I would like to see happen is for um, the opportunity that's been created by this media coverage to be picked up by ECAN, DOC, LINS, the Federated Farmers, Forest and Bird, and for us all to sit down together and say, right, um, two issues. One is, the most important one is, what do we do to stop these sort of things happening again in the future in the high country, in the areas which have not yet been um, intensified? Um, the second thing is to have a look at, at you know, is there some stuff we can do back in the areas where, in the 12,000 hectares, is there something we can do there that makes it better from a rate of river perspective? The priority, however, is looking at the future and the stuff that's actually not been damaged. Mm. So it's, it's a, I mean, it's a real opportunity that comes out of something that maybe we didn't, didn't think was a very positive thing to begin with. Mm. Yeah, and I think I like how you're referring to it as an opportunity. You see this as an opportunity, and the fact that it is out in the public, that's a good thing, right? Look, absolutely, and, and from my listening to the, the media comment from reading the paper, um, I, I, I think most of, the, most of the coverage has been pretty positive. Um, it's, it's highlighted issues, it's brought um, to a, a much wider group of people's attention issues that some people who are very passionate about this were struggling to get um, gets the wider attention to. That's got to be positive and, and I, I don't know anyone who, who thinks that the idea of, of continuing of continuing to expand farming onto braided rivers is actually a good idea. So as we won't see any additional expansion of farming into river beds from now on, like it's consents that have been granted years and years and years ago. I mean I, I think I think in the case of the of the land that he can um, has some influence over, which is basically all the private land yeah. and our own land. I think um, it's going to be, it would be very, very difficult under the rules regime that we've currently got in place for a landowner to get a consent to farm on Braided River. Um, we couldn't have said that a few years ago. We couldn't have said that we had the support of regulation and legislation to do that, before, but we do have it now. Um, some people would say it's a, it's a shame you didn't have it 20 years ago. Well, there's a lot of things that we would like to have 20 years ago. We've now got it, so it's going to be very, very difficult for anyone to intensify into braided rivers in the future or, in, or to impose, impinge onto the river margins um, that sort of protect those braided rivers. Mm -hmm. But having said that, I mean, I don't think that there are too many farmers out there who've actually done something that wasn't actually consented they weren't allowed to do under the rules frame that we have there. There will be some. There's always somebody who stretches the boundary a little bit too far. There's always somebody who thinks they, get, who thinks they can get away with doing something without complying with rules. But most people will have actually gone to great lengths, I'm sure, to get a consent to do it. And as I'm repeating myself, we did not have the rules framework in place that clearly said this was not an appropriate action. In fact, the rules framework we had in place allowed it. 